I make it 12 o'clock. Okay, I make it 12 o'clock, so we're just about ready to start. If you want the last few people, grab a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Um, this is a session, it's broken, now what? Problem solving, practical problem solving. Um, I've been sort of building this session for the past 15 years working in IT. Um, we all work in IT, I assume, right? We're all at an IT conference, so um, I, I seem to run into quite a few different scenarios where um, things break and it's not always obvious exactly how to fix the problem. And I've also noticed there's quite a few uh, of our clients, I'm a consultant, so quite a few clients of ours who seem to approach problems in a way that doesn't seem to make sense to me and causes basically so bottlenecks in trying to solve the problem. So we're going to go through a few scenarios of things that I've seen and how I've approached to solve the problem. It's going to be some interaction with you as well. There's going to be a few quizzes, well, a few questions. Um, and hopefully we should be able to get an idea of how I sort of approach problem solving. There's no exactly one perfect way to do so, uh, but it's just what I've, I've uh, experienced in the past. So obviously this event is free for everybody to attend. It's not free to make this place or this event run. So all these sponsors really do need to feel appreciated. You do that in going and speaking to them. Five minutes of your time during the coffee break or in lunch break. Um, of course, they're trying to sell something, but it's not that they're trying to sell tat, right? They don't get chosen as sponsors because they're going to try and push some rubbish on you. You never know what they're offering. Maybe it's services, maybe it's a product, maybe it can help you out. Um, one of the misnomers that I seem to get is monitoring for your SQL servers. We're going to build it ourselves. Don't do that, right? Speak to these people. If they're building a product of that type, um, of course you can build something yourself, but the time investment is just not worth it. Just buy a product, right? So enough of the sales. Go and speak to these guys. They make the whole thing possible today, okay? If they don't get enough feedback from attendees, then they'll question whether or not they should even bother next time, okay? Um, one th slide that oh, I only noticed is posted on some of the walls around here um, they, uh, was, was forgotten. There's a program, a speaker scholarship program being set up by the Data Scotland team. Um, all the speakers who come here and speak do so on their own cost. If they're employed and their employer so deems it as a business expense and gets to pay for the flights and hotel, fantastic. There's quite a few people who don't get that. Um, this whole scholarship program is an idea to help make that easier for speakers. So if you enjoy today and you want to go to the user group, for example, and have a speaker come from away from Glasgow, whether it's from Edinburgh or from Egypt, doesn't matter. Um, it all has a cost associated to it and they will gladly take donations to make the, make the fund actually happen, okay? Um, if you can give, that would be fantastic. Okay, quick intro to who I am. My name's William Durkin. Um, I'm a co-owner of a company called Data Masterminds. Started it a couple of years ago with two friends of mine, and we help companies make sure they're doing the right things with their data landscape around the Microsoft stack. I've been working with SQL Server for over 15 years now. As a DBA, a system architect, um, I used to do it, well, no. At the very beginning, I did a BI project. I hated it, and I've never touched BI since. So any BI questions, I know someone who can help you, right? <laughs> Um, you can reach out to me online, I'm on LinkedIn, Twitter, you can send me an email. If you've got questions about this session or any other sort of things around SQL Server, except for BI, no problems, just get in touch. I'm quite happy to help. Okay, there won't be an invoice. You have to worry about that. Um, I also co-authored a book on SQL Server 2016 Developing. Um, it was a tortuous experience, it took a long time, lots of hours in, late into the night, uh, lots of sleepless nights. Um, I vowed to never do it again, which is why we then did the 2017 book. But I'm really not doing the 2019 book. That's being written. I'm the, the technical um, uh, Czech author guy on that book. I'm not writing anymore. So uh, I can tell you all, if you're going to write a book, don't. <laughs> or if you, maybe you want to, but be expecting to not sleep for about three months. OK, enough about me. We're going to talk about problems. And the first thing that we need to do when there's a problem is to triage the problem. And triaging comes out of the medical sort of space is to determine how badly a patient is doing. Right? You go to ER and you've cut your finger 
and then you're sitting for hours and hours in a in an ER. Okay, you can moan about it being the NHS. That's not quite true. Um, somebody who comes in and is completely non-responsive to anything, they're going to jump the queue, right? There's the whole triage process. It's who is suffering the most, which is the most important. Um, the same sort of thing we need to do in IT as well. So I get, I'm guessing, let's see, who is a DBA or sysadmin? Two, three, four people. Okay, the rest, developers? Two, three, four, right? And there's another rest, BI people maybe? No, that's still not everybody. Anybody who didn't put their hand up want to shout out what they do? Support. Okay, help desk, yeah? A student. Okay, so you're at the very beginning. So hopefully these tips will help you to make sure you're doing the right things from the beginning. Uh, a manager. I'm going to guess there's a manager in here, right? One, two. Okay, so you're the ones who we're going to be uh, bashing a bit later on. Um, Pay attention, there'll be some things to, to recognize as well as a, mass, a manager. So, yeah, triaging a problem. Oftentimes, uh, at least for me as a DBA, it will be an email and it will be priority one and the system's broken and drop everything, it needs fixed in now. Where, um, just as a DBA or a sysadmin, you have quite often a larger focus on the entire environment than just one single system, right? So as a DBA myself, um, in a previous life before becoming a consultant, I was responsible for a few hundred servers, uh, a few thousand databases. Now, of course, I can't know each and every one, but in general, I have a world map in my mind of what these systems each do. And quite often, I will, because these databases are the center point for multiple applications, I'll have an idea of how those applications interact as well. So this is my part of triage, is to understand, yes, of course, User B, your system has broken. It can't take whatever you're trying to do with it. And it's really bad for your part of your life. But in the grand scheme of things for the business, how critical is that for me? Right? And my response time is going to be very much focused on um, more the business decision rather than the technical. And this is something I've had to learn over these 15 years. Um, I'm I'm a techie, right? I love the geeky details. I love to see if there's a problem, can I fix it? And I would love to drop everything and fix every single problem when, I, when they pop up. It's just not possible. There are so many systems. Like, like I say, if I'm looking after 100 servers and a few thousand databases, there's no way I can fix all of the problems all of the time. There are some things I'm just going to have to let lie. So the, this triaging thing is really important. And it's something um, for a, a student, for example, it's not going to be very easy if it's your first job and you're, you're now in the DBA team or in the sysadmin team to instinctively know how important a system is going to be. Uh, it's something that, unfortunately, you're going to have to learn over time and also according to the business as well. So it's taken me quite a long time also to try and twist myself away from just looking at the technical problem and to think of the business side of it. Right, how much is this system worth to the business per hour, day, week, whatever? Um, if it's a tiny little system that's used by two, three people who may be really important in the company, but their system is broken and someone else's system is broken, that's 90% of the business, I know where I've got to basically focus my, uh, my attention. So, um, belonging to problem triage and identifying the, the importance of a system is um, basically an SLA, service level agreements. So who here has an SLA implemented or documented in their company? So that's like a quarter, maybe a third of the room, okay. Um, maybe you don't know if there's an SLA in your company, that's also completely okay. Um, the people who had your hands up to say you have an SLA, um, is it upheld? Do you hit your SLA? Do you hit your targets all the time? Hand up if you do. Two people, okay? Uh, three people, two or two and a half, right? Um, I know we had SLAs at my company when we had the 100 servers, 1,000 databases. Um, we didn't hit our SLAs because quite a lot of the time the SLA was not correctly defined or it was the typical uh, five nines. So five nines we've, I think we've heard of, right? Um, so just going to go through a table of what these five nines mean. Now, five nines is 99.999% availability, right? 
So 1.9 is 90%. This gives us quite relaxed downtime uh, availability for us, or how, how often our system can be offline. Uh, 2.4 hours a day. So basically, you just turn the server off whenever you want. No one cares, right? And it gets relatively quickly. It gets more and more um, uh, critical if a system's going to be offline, if you're going to keep to that SLA. So five nines is almost the pinnacle of what you can expect. Um, five minutes or 5.2 minutes per year. Now, um, lots and lots of companies strive for something like five nines. And it's really nice to try and do that. But to hit five nines is going to be extremely expensive. So there's a couple of hands back in that corner saying you're hitting your SLAs. Are you going by nines? Is there three nines, two nines, five nines? <laughs> okay, so for the stream, they've, they've had SLAs for about a month, so they've been hitting their targets. Fantastic. Um, so does your SLA just say something like, we need 99.99% of it? Okay, so at the moment, they're at 80%. So the, my favorite part about this is the five nines. Um, you'll get this with British Telecom. Even for your home connection, you have an SLA in there. It won't have any penalty clauses in it, right? They say, you're paying us however many pounds a month for your phone, uh, phone line, and we, will we guarantee with a star that we will have whatever percent availability with a star. Same thing for a business line. So you've got a business internet connection with BT or with whoever. Um, they always have a little star. And the star basically is their get out of jail free clause. Um, these nines usually pertain to unplanned outages. So if BT is going to dig up the street and put new cables into your street at your office or at your home, that's planned maintenance. They've told you in advance, so it doesn't count to the availability. Right? So um, we can also twist this if we're going to plan and design an SLA. Who here works, or whose company here, um, is an actual 24-7 operation? Hands up. Two, three, four, five, six people out of 60? I don't know. Tiny percentage, right? Um, most businesses, most companies that I look after, are an 8 till 5, or 9 to 5, or 8 to 6. Something normal office hours, effectively, right? Monday to Friday, Monday to Saturday. Um, so does this five nines belong to the 24-7 operation or does it belong to office hours? And exactly what does an outage mean in terms of the business? So this is something that I have lots and lots of conversations about. Um, for example, we have a web application which has a database below it. And uh, we have availability groups installed so that our database is super high available. There's a really decent um, uh, availability. There's, there's patching is not a problem because we can fail over almost instantly. Um, we've, we've covered all of those parts. However, we only have one connection from our database to the internet where our web service is. Right? Um, company I used to work for in the mail order operation they're a, a large mail order operation in Germany. I didn't even mention this. I moved to Germany 18 years ago. I came from Leeds to Germany. So working at this company, and they had two different sites on one side, uh, on opposite sides of a street. There's the big warehouse where all of the stuff was that they sent out, and the call center and operation systems and whatnot in the, in the other building. They had two data centers. They had... Um, SQL Server clusters, they had SAN storage that was replicated between the two so that if the data center should die, then it's not a problem. Um, what else did we have? We had redundant internet connections, redundant uh, network connections, also a wireless um, directional antenna to make sure that that wasn't a problem. And um, they said, we're safe. There's no problems at all. Um, problem being, first of all, not really going to happen, but we were right next to a nuclear power plant. So the entire operation, there was no backups except for in this site, right? So right next to being 
quarter of a mile away from a nuclear power plant. It's not likely that, that thing's going to explode, but it could happen, right? So what's your business continuity? What's your availability? That should happen. These things don't get planned because people say it will never happen. Um, they had redundant um, network connections between the two sites. What they forgot or what didn't really plan was the fact that both of these wires went out of the data center into the same trench through the road and then to the next building. So, of course, what happened? There was some roadworks. They hit the trench and ripped up both network connections. They was like, oh, yeah, but we've got our wireless connection between the two sites with the antenna that's pointing between the buildings, except there was a tree that had grown that they had planted six years before. <laughs> so there was no connection anymore. Um, so all of these parts just fit together perfectly to a perfect storm. And like I say, there's a nuclear power plant. Oh, that will never explode. Yeah, that's fine. Um, what happens if you're in a flight path, a pl path of an airport? A plane could land on you. It's not likely going to happen. can happen. There's many, many different areas and scenarios that need to be considered, at least, to be written down to plan against an outage. So, five nines, all wonderful. Um, in most cases, I discuss and say, right, it's great to have these wonderful lofty goals of five nines, but it's not realistic. Even Microsoft can't really go beyond four nines. They can advertise five, they can advertise six, um, but there's just so many moving parts in a system that fine, we can guarantee our database is online, but if nobody can connect to it, it's going to be a problem. Um, or similar sort of a scenario, what would happen if you are Mesk, the largest container ship company in the world? You know, the big shipping containers, they own the largest ships and the most of them, and they were hit by ransomware. And that knocked out their entire IT operations across the globe. They had nothing left, like zero nothing, because their, their backup was... It was on a different location, but it was connected to the corporate network. So the ransomware went through to their backup site as well. And their solution to fix that was they realized, I think it was an office in Ghana, Kenya, Kenya, um, had a semi-online domain controller. They'd lost, even that to the domain controller level, they'd lost everything. Uh, except for this one office in Kenya where the domain controller had intermittent internet connection. And it was still alive. It had not been hit by ransomware. So somebody made a very quick phone call and said, turn off the internet for your office in Kenya. They then sent somebody from, I think it was like London office, to go and get the server from Kenya. Couldn't get a visa in time. So had to meet somebody from Kenya in Morocco to swap disks around and fly back. Nobody could think that they would need to do this, right? Mask, they have a very good IT team. Really, really good. But there is the inevitable point where this will never happen actually happens. So it's for the managers in the room, it's terrible. You're going to want to have SLAs. You're going to want to have run books and plans of, a, of approach to how to solve a problem. You will have a problem that you've not planned for. So that's the one where you either just quit and walk away or have some sort of a nuclear option on how to solve a problem. So that comes to documentation and communication. Um, when things break, we need to try and keep calm and level-headed. I don't know how many occasions I've had it that a system has gone offline and it's my job to fix a problem and the manager keeps coming finished yet when's it fixed are you almost done is it back online when can I be online what do I tell the users right it's the worst situation of all um, anybody experienced that I saw a few like heads nodding yes almost the whole room yes okay um, the managers in the room have you done this always how helpful is it it helps you, but objectively to problem solving, it doesn't really help, right? Um, 
as the problem solver in that situation, it's partly my fault as well. If the manager is continually having to ask, is it fixed yet? When's it fixed? When is it back online? It's because I have not communicated what's going on, right? So of course, as a techie, behind closed doors, I'm like the damn manager. But it is on me as well and on you all. So <clears throat> to pinpoint and triage, we need to know which system it is that's broken and what's affected. Because as soon as we can ignore certain systems, the better, right? Knowing how the systems work together is really important, which is why the first word on the slide is documentation. It's the thing that I hate the most, sitting down making Word documents or PowerPoint presentations or Visio diagrams. It's the worst thing in my job. I hate it. If anybody knows of a system that can do documentation for me, yes, please. Right, there are certain things you can do. You can read out configurations and usernames and network connections and things like this. There are some fantastic tools out there, but they won't do everything. So unfortunately, to make your life easier in the long run, you're going to have to spend a long time doing documentation. Think of it as investing in saving yourself later on. Because afterwards, when the problems are there and you don't have documentation, you can only kick yourself. Right? <clears throat> Who needs to know? This is the part where we're going to be talking with our manager. Hopefully, you would have maybe an application owner or a business unit owner who knows who else needs to be informed. In my opinion, it's not the techie's job to be sending an email out to the entire company. That's ridiculous. Your time is going to be wasted interacting around that message. That should be the manager's job. And there's a saying in German, I will not bother going to say it, but basically telling your boss pushes the problem to them, right? It's their problem to deal with at that point. So the manager who says it helps him, that's fine. Then it's their job to make sure the rest of the company knows. And in fact, a manager or a team lead, a lead DBA, whatever, is the one that should be pr protecting or shielding the team that's actually working on the problem. And it's something that I've seen rarely implemented but works really well, is also to have a predefined task force on problem solving because it's never just the SQL Server has fallen over, or very rarely, I'm mean, going never say never, right? But it's, rarely that, it's rare that it's just one system that's an issue, especially in this day and age where we have virtualization and we have, um, uh, what else? Well, actually just virtualization, that already messes with us, right? Or containers, or um, we've got Active Directory in play, we've got DNS, we've got networking, storage, all these different things that all play together. Um, some of us in the room are probably admins for all of those things, like the loan DBA, loan system admin, whatever. And those people, I'm really sorry for you. I know the pain. It's not nice. Um, all I can hope for is that you would, um, at some point, either get a colleague or get a new job. Um, it's never easy to be the, the boss of all the different systems. Um, Lost my train of thought. Where were we? We're at all the different systems. Um, yes, a task force. So um, recently, a client of ours, it's um, a hospital in the Netherlands. They have everything virtualized. They have um, storage admins. They have Active Directory admins. So they have siloed responsibilities. Fantastic. Um, they don't have any plan of action when things break. So. Their entire data center lost power, which in itself shouldn't really happen, but these things happen, right? So all the servers were offline. Star, uh, power came back on, and they fired up all of the servers. And the SQL server, why, I don't know why, the SQL server was the first server that came online. Oh, yeah. Fire alarm. That's what I was told. Right. So um, SQL Server was the first one that came online. Then the web server for the application. And of course, the users tried to connect to the application and do the job. They were getting fail uh, errors, login errors. Anybody want to hazard a guess why there was going to be login errors? There'd be no configuration changes at all. Say again? 
Bang, straight away. Correct answer. The answer was AD. Attention, please. Attention, please. Fire has been reported in the building. Please leave the building immediately by the nearest exit. Do not use the lift. starts talking he's going to do it again right <clears throat> so the gentleman said Active Directory was not online so SQL Server started before Active Directory was back up so there was no authentication working the client had no idea that that was <laughs> so <laughs> Because it's siloed teams and they didn't speak to each other, the SQL Server team didn't even know that they needed Active Directory to be online, or rather didn't realize that Active Directory wasn't already online. Right? So if they were an effective team, they would speak to each other and say, actually, we have a run book when we need to restart everything. This is the order that we do it in. Right? So the key word there is a run book. It's not a new thing. If you Google about run books, it's basically just actual steps. This is how we're going to solve a problem. Or this is how, not, not even a problem, this is how we will install a new server in our network. We take these steps. And nowadays, of course, we're going to be using automation to do these run books. So we would have scripts which do those same things. Anyways, back to here. How does it affect business? Um, like I said, if the system is tiny and insignificant, how really important is it, regardless of what the user says? This is the part where the manager is needed to make sure that when the, when the techie says this isn't important, they don't just say that to the end user because no one wants to hear that, right? Your problem is not important. Uh, the manager needs to then translate that into user speak, which would be, we understand it's a problem, we're all working on it, and blah, 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 blah. I'm not a manager. I don't need to do those things. It's really good. I can just say, it's broken. This is how to fix it. And yes, documentation and run books to help remediate. You cannot have run books for everything, as we mentioned, right? The plane landing on the data center, you don't, what, what is your solution there? Um, I think you have different problems if that happens, right? Um, I've had many discussions where people tried to get that detailed in their run book and documentation set up. If your entire data center has exploded, my opinion, you don't really need to be worrying about getting one SQL Server or even all SQL Servers back online. You've got huge problems internally to fix, right? It's good to have an idea and maybe have a backup offsite DR situation set up. And this is where you can start discussing that. Maybe you start using the cloud for that. Plenty of clients, especially in Germany, who don't like the cloud, but then have that sort of a discussion where you say, okay, we'll just go and rent a new data center for X hundred thousand a year. Um, those are the sorts of things that you need to co communicate and document ahead of time. Keep away from the five nines requirements. That's, in my opinion, almost irrelevant. You need more how to have a, I think it's called, is it a business continuity plan? It's much more interesting. That gives somebody, especially high up in a company, a much better frame of reference. They don't care about five minutes per year outage. They also don't care if you're using SQL 2012 or 2019. They care, they can sell their widgets. Whatever they need to do to make the widgets be sold needs to be done. And it needs to cost less than the cost of a widget. That's all they care about, right? So. Try and uh, yeah, change the focus in that respect to make that work. Also, really, really useful, something called a post-mortem. Normally with dead people, right? But in this case, it's with dead systems. Um, I found this really useful GitHub repository by somebody who collects technical post-mortems from companies who publish them online. People like Microsoft, Amazon, uh, whoever else. It's a fantastic repository, and it's been categorized into technical issues, hardware broken, uh, human error, 
Human error, by the way, is probably the highest reason for a system to, be, to, to break in general. Um, a post-mortem is basically a what happened, how did it happen, how do we prevent it from happening again. It's really, really important that if you have a system outage of any kind that you don't start pointing blame. Yes, if it's human error, somebody made a mistake. You shouldn't be saying person A made the mistake. It was, it was possible to make this mistake. How can we avoid that in the future? So business part of mine is speaking here today. Um, broke database mirroring for a rather large client. Uh, he misconfigured it, clicked the wrong button, whatever it was, broke it. They identified how he'd broken it. They fixed it. And half an hour later, he broke it again. That's when, of course, it was his fault. But the manager then said, OK, this was brilliant manager time. You've broken it in two different ways in such a short period of time. First of all, please don't touch mirroring today. <laughs> and second of all, how can we mitigate this? How do we stop it from ever happening again? Um, one of the big ones is use automation. Anybody here not using PowerShell yet? Hands up. Half a hand. Everybody else, two halves of hands, three, four. It's okay. We're in a safe space. You're allowed to say you don't use PowerShell, right? Um, automation is key. If I've written a script, it will do the same thing every single time, and I won't fat finger anything. Using the GUI is nice to understand and to see how things work, but in especially in a critical situation, I don't want to be using a GUI. I want my script, which can fix the problem. Or I use my script in the first place to avoid a problem from even happening. Right? So, to get from a problem to a solution, we need to understand the problem. And I think, is it this one? Uh, break down the error. Yeah, of course, that makes sense. Some of the error messages that we'll get are huge, long, and don't really make sense, or are very generic. But this one is possibly the most important. Read the damn error message. In a lot of cases, we will get an error message that tells us what is wrong. And I'm, this is almost a weekly occurrence for me. It gets, it's getting less and less as I educate my uh, clients. The error message tells you what is wrong. And I'm sure we've all seen it, whether at home with your family who aren't really computer skilled, or at work, equally, where the users are not necessarily great with computers, where an error message just pops up and they hit the X to get rid of it, right? The, in most cases, especially in our sort of area, the error messages are useful. They do mean something. And the best thing you can do is copy the exact error text and paste it into Google. It's the first thing, yeah, right? I mean, we, we all chuckle and laugh. I, there are so many people that I see who don't even start at the basics of exact error message, look on Google, right? Um, of course, it's difficult when you've got like server names or IP addresses or whatever. Just remove like the, the sensitive information. The error message itself will quite often give you a blog post by somebody who's hit that problem five times before. And I have also Googled for problems that I've solved before that I have blogged myself and in the meantime have forgotten. That's also something I could say, start blogging, even if it's for nobody else but your own, your own mind, right? To just dump all of those problems into some central repository. It can even be an internal wiki at your work. That's completely fine. But don't make yourself re have to relearn a, a problem or solving a problem. And is it even a problem? So this is, again, this whole triaging thing. Is what somebody's telling you even a problem, or can we ignore it? So we're going to go scenarios. Two scenarios we're going to see today. And I would like you to help me solve them. This is a 5,000 total employee company. There have been no personnel changes in the last quarter. 50 people work in the office, and the rest in warehouses spread around. Okay. 
There's a database for the telephone system, it's the, the phone book, so that people know which phone number for which person. It reads from a SQL database and it refreshes on a daily cycle. The connection string points to a DNS, phonebook.mycompany, and it's a SQL 2000 hardware box. So it's not virtualized, it's SQL 2000, completely out of support from Microsoft. The hardware itself is 15 years old and it's dead, right? And to top it all off, our backups have been failing for the last three weeks. So, any suggestions on how we would, suggest, how we would approach fixing this problem? So, lots and lots of voices. Somebody hand up and we can go. Yeah. Take the backup from Monday, from, from, from a month ago where nothing has changed. Yep. Is it a critical problem? So we can just break it down. 50 employees working in an office of 5,000 people. So that's 0.01% of the, of the population of the company is affected. That's not very many people. However, of course, telephone book, quite important. You've got to be able to know the telephone numbers of people you're going to call. Um, however, it's a refresh cycle of the telephone book. It's a daily thing. So it refreshed yesterday. Today, the server's dead. So the telephone itself has still got the entries in it. So we've not lost any information just yet. There's been no personnel changes in the last quarter. So the month, the backup from a month ago, completely okay. So we would restore the backup onto a virtualized machine. We can still run SQL 2000 database on a newer version of SQL Server. It's quite possible to do that. And we just change our DNS alias, right? Quite simple. Starts off sounding a bit freaky. It's tight 5,000 people potentially. In, we've got problems with backups. There's quite a few other issues that need fixing on the back of this, right? Why is the backup failing and no one's known about it for three weeks? Somebody's not doing their job, or it's a system that you don't know about. And so on and so on, right? Scenario two, really, really simple one. There we go. CTO's assistant is called saying the CTO can't access the reports. No more information. Critical? Yes or no? The CTO controls the budget, so potentially critical. So, of course, there is so much information missing here. CTOs calling about reports. Which reports? What time are they calling? When do they need the reports? Blah, 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 blah. So, of course, it's not fair of me. I've hidden all that information. This is Friday afternoon. It's 5.30 in the afternoon. The CTO is requesting a report for next week, Wednesday. And also, the report server is offline for the scheduled maintenance that the CTO agreed upon, right? Um, that happens quite a lot, that the second part of the information, or there's lots of information missing from an outage report, that the immediate response was, it's critical, the CTO, the boss of me and all of my dominion, is in trouble and is not happy. Well, yeah, they don't really need it right now. They were just looking at the report so that they can prepare their presentation for next week. If they wait half an hour, everything's back online, right? So this is also a part of the communication on the other side of the conversation. We as techies need to make sure we communicate what's going on, but we also need to be given enough information to even start solving the problem. So in this case, it's not even a problem at all because we can just say, it's fine. The CTO knows we've got maintenance. He's probably just forgotten it, but the maintenance is going to be finished in 20 minutes and then the reports are back online. Right? Okay. So, demo time. What we're going to do now is hopefully break a few things and see how to approach solving them. Okay? I did this presentation a few weeks back in India and managed to actually break my presentation <laughs> before it was time. So, I did a little bit of live problem solving as well, which was interesting. So, what we have here is, no zoom it, okay, never mind, let's silence that. We have a SQL Server and we have a database 
called Break Me. And I hope it's visible there, even without zooming. It's in recovery pending. So I've done nothing beyond start my SQL Server. How do we start approaching looking at this problem? The database is offline, it's broken, I can't access it. Any ideas? First step. Say again? Checking if there's any backup. We do need to make sure we have backups, but before we're even there, all we can see here is the server's offline. Any, any other ideas? Check the error log. Check the error log. Yep. First thing, right, for, at least for me, SQL Server has an error log. Just the name tells me there's going to be errors in there, right? It's actually a terrible name because they're not just errors in there. There are all sorts of things in there. So let's go. Uh, where are you? SQL Server logs. Hopefully, we'll have the information here. And of course, it does not have Zoom. He does not have Zoom installed. Wonderful. Let's copy this into here. Or let's not copy it because why should it? Copy. Maybe I'll just read it. Is it in here? Okay. File activation failure. The physical file name e slash data slash breakme log dot ldf may be incorrect. Okay, so it's telling me there's something wrong with one of the files associated with the database. Next step. Have a look in the directory. <clears throat> Let's do that. We will go into e data. And of course, we can't zoom. But where, where is it? Oh. Normal details. We have breakme ldf and breakme underscore log dot ldf. The file is there. Weird. Any ideas? That isn't an LDF. That isn't an LDF. It looks like an IDF, maybe. Bingo. So, it's a bit cheeky, and it's probably difficult to see from here. Um, it's a capital I instead of an L. Right? I could have been even more evil and said from here, we'll go into the command prompt. Or will we? Now my machine's dead. Okay, we'll change the presentation on how to fix a laptop. No, we won't. Like this, we can also not see, really. Or can we? Change the font there, maybe? Uh, properties, font. Here we go. So, a bit cheeky. Changed it to an IDF. So, if we can just change that back. Yes, please continue. Now we can also see here it's got the icon correct and it's associated with SQL Server again. We should be able to just bring this back online. Uh, take offline. Okay. And tasks, bring online. Well, hey, database is back online. Now, if we had have just gone down the road of backups, we would have spent time and been able to restore, right? The, the database would come back online. Um, but in this case, just a little bit more digging, and we've already solved the problem without having to go for our backups. Because we don't know if we're going to lose data there. Just to say, I said to check if there are any. You did say to check if there are any. This is completely true. So, of course. Because if there's not, then we start prioritizing it higher. Because we might have a problem that we can't go recognize from the system. This is also very true. OK, so I should, have, I should have begun with we have backups, right? This is true. So the point made was, um, if we don't know if we have backups, then we need to be very careful with how we try and fix this problem. If we know for sure we have a backup, or even more importantly, we have a restorable backup, a backup is actually valueless. A restorable backup is what you really need. Um, if we don't have a backup, then we need to be extremely careful with how we approach problem solving of that type. <clears throat> 
right? The database is offline and seemingly broken. If we don't have a backup, then we've got to be very careful we don't lose everything. Anyways, now we're going to do something slightly different. This is replication. Really simple. We've got two databases, a publisher DB and a subscriber DB. And we have a simple, simple table. It's been replicated. It's one column with some data in it. Nothing special. We don't need to understand replication directly to try and fix this problem. What we're going to do, let's take a look inside the table. Select start from test table. And we can see there are, there's some data in there, right? There is actually 100 rows in there, and it's a row 1 to 100 is, is the value that's inside it. We're going to insert some data, a single row, value 101. And we should see, I wasn't quick enough. Yes, I was not quick enough. This is a count on the test table itself and on the other side where the data has been replicated to as well. Both of them have a count of 101. That makes sense. So let's get rid of this error message. Now, what I'm going to do is force an error. We're, transpo we're transporting the data from our table, test table, from one database to the other. Replication is completely stupid. It doesn't know anything about the target other than it will fill it with the data from our starting point. So I've now inserted data into our target table. So the value 102 is in there. If we do a count on both sides, we will see that we have 101 in our publishing side and 102 in our subscriber. It should never really happen, but it can happen. Now, if we try and insert two rows into our starting table, our publishing table, it's fine. It's not a problem. We've got those two rows in there. And now, because replication is running in the background continuously, it's trying to push those data, that data change to our target, target table. We'll now, hopefully, let's change that actually to output as text then we can see a little bit better. 103 rows in our publishing side, 102 rows on our target. So the target has not changed at all. And if we take a look at our replication monitor, this is where I'm hoping it's going to work the way I expect. We have a message here, error executing a batch of commands, retrying commands. And if we look slightly below, it's already giving us the error message because replication will completely continue trying to send the data from our first table to our target. And our S error message says, violation of primary key constraint, blah, blah, blah. Nope. Cannot insert the duplicate key, value of 102. So, because we're reading the damn error message, it's telling us exactly what is wrong. It's trying to insert 102 into our test table on our replication subscriber. So, how do we fix it? We have two options. Nuclear option, we destroy the target table and recreate it with the entire data set. Or, option two, any guesses? Delete that row. Delete that row. So where do we delete the row, though? On the publishing side or the subscriber side? Subscriber side. So, hopefully, where are we? Not that one. There we are. Delete the row. That was successful. And depending on how quickly replication recovers, we still have 103 rows on our publishing side, 101 rows on our subscriber side. So those two rows that we inserted, 102 and 103, are still not arrived yet. I've now talked long enough. It should get there. There we go, 103, 103. Now, in this case, this is a problem with replication on a tiny table. I used to be looking after um, tables with hundreds of millions of rows. You can imagine the nuclear option of reseeding the entire table, something you want to avoid as much as possible. Right? Slightly creative solution to fix the problem. 
Um, but at the same time, completely logical, right? If we break the problem down into its constituent parts, we can see the insert is failing because there's a duplicate key. Remove the duplicate and we get the data clean, right? There is also actually a third option that we should not really ever go for, and that is to tell replication, ignore errors. And what it would then do is throw away the insert of 102 and continue with 103. But please don't do that, because that means something is going completely wrong, right? You're ignoring errors. We don't want to ignore errors. We want to fix them. Because at, at this point, and this has happened to me with a client in production, the question was, where did that row come from? How did that happen on the target system? Because the whole idea is it shouldn't be that way. Right? OK, so I've got 10 minutes left. There'll be one last case, which I'm going to talk about. Where are we? Here. How many people have had, let's see if we get the error message directly. No, it's going to happen in a second. Um, have had a data file fill up completely. We get an error message, we can't insert any more data because the data file is full. Yeah, happens sometimes. Um, usually, we have auto growth turned on for a database to make sure that it's going to be okay. Um, that's not always the case. Is this going to error for me? Come on. Um, or the disk itself has filled up. Same, same problem, basically, right? We've got no more space to be able to allocate for new data. What I'm trying to do, and I'm hoping this demo will work, worked about half an hour ago, is I've created a big table in TempDB. All it's doing is filling it with rubbish data, and that insert is going 2,000 times. This might be a trick you don't know about. The go statement inside Management Studio separates batches. And in this case, by doing go 2,000, I'm telling it everything I've marked should be executed 2,000 times. It's a cheap and dirty way to make a loop. So come on, error for me. Or did I fix the problem? Maybe that was the issue. Ah, no, now I remember. So I didn't let it fill up. What I did was, um, we're in the scenario, the, disk, the database has filled up. So I have plenty of clients where they're doing huge data loads into data warehouses at nighttime. They're throwing data into TempDB because it's easier to just store it there, do some work on it, and then push it into an actual database. And they've hit the threshold, and the load process has failed. So they then said, how can I find out where in the process, which command it was that's just exploding the data inside the database, right? Um, so what I came up with was something called uh, an extended event session. Extended events are similar to Profiler inside SQL Server. S anybody not know what extended events or Profiler is? You're allowed to say you don't know. It's OK. OK, there's a few people. So if we want to find out which commands are running against SQL Server in general, maybe we're trying to do a performance uh, troubleshooting uh, situation. There's a tool called Profiler. It's really, really old. It's been around since forever. It basically hooks into SQL Server, and we say, for example, user ABC, I want to see everything that they are, use, they are doing in the database. And it's like a, a live stream of the commands that are being sent. You can decide exactly which information you want to collect. The problem is Profiler itself and the, the, the uh, mechanism behind that, which was um, server tracing, was built so long ago that it's not very fast nowadays. And Microsoft had huge problems trying to troubleshoot for clients who had terabytes of databases and thousands or hundreds of thousands of users. So they came up with something called event, uh, extended events, which is basically a lighter weight version of the same thing. So if you've never used Profiler or extended events before, Try and focus only on extended events. That's the thing that's being continued. Profiler has been deprecated. It will still work probably forever because Microsoft doesn't get rid of product anymore. But extended events is the better, the lighter weight version. All I did was I said, please collect for tempdb, which is database ID, to any application, hostname, 
database name, what else? Uh, uh, username and the command that they issued which caused a database to grow. Okay, so for tempdb, I can't remember what my settings are, something absolutely terrible because this is a demo. So please don't take this as gospel as to how you should set up tempdb. Uh, it's growing by 10 megabytes whenever the uh, files fill up. So every time I create 10 megabytes worth of data, tempdb's data files will grow 10 megabytes, right? And every time this growth gets triggered, I'm going to collect that information even when the server has broken. So in this case, if tempdb were to fill up completely and not be able to grow anymore, then the entire SQL Server stops because tempdb is really use, used a lot internally by SQL Server. In this case, we've done this ETL, it's crashed the server, and we would lose the information that was going on inside there. With extended events, I've said, don't worry about that. Write that information onto the files, uh, file server, or into file system. So even if the server is dead, forever, I can still find out what was happening at that time. So I then can jump in here and find out, again without a zoom, that exactly I was responsible for running an insert into this big table at exactly what time that it triggered the file growth to happen. Okay? There will be a link to the blog post that has that information on how to set it up on your own systems. It's very, very lightweight and it's just one of many little tools that you can use to help you make sure your systems are okay. Right, so in the last five minutes, we get back into here. An ounce of prevention will save you a pound of uh, remedy. I think it's the same. Basically, Although we've looked at how to start approaching problem solving and try and break things down and everything, the most important thing is to have a clean environment. If you're not doing regular maintenance on your car, it's not surprising that it will break down when it's raining or snowing, right? It's always going to happen when it's the least convenient. But if you're making sure you're doing regular maintenance, then your car is going to be much better overall, right? Same thing applies here. If we have standardization, that will help us to know immediately certain things are already okay. Something that's now becoming more and more apparent, or more used as well, is containers and Kubernetes, right? It used to be that we would name our servers after a certain scheme, right? Um, I used to work at a company, they used to call them after the different Greek gods or after uh, Disney characters or whatever, right? There are all sorts of different weird naming schemes. Uh, nowadays, somebody, I can't remember who said it, they said you shouldn't treat, the, treat your servers like your pets, you should treat them like cattle. They shouldn't have names. You should be quite happy to be able to throw them away and start again, right? Containers makes that really, really easy because you can immediately destroy and recreate a container without having to think about <coughs> patching, for example. This is where if you've not touched Kubernetes and containers, and I've only touched it a little bit, the power of that stuff will be that will blow you away completely. If we don't need to patch anymore because we just throw a container away and spin up one that's already patched, we can save ourselves a lot of hassle, right? So this is saying here regular patching and upgrades. What we actually want is to not spend our time doing that anymore, right? If we can immediately move our database from one already patched or old system to an already patched one. This is the future. Um, I was reading a blog post this morning by the Microsoft team around how they do patching of the Azure SQL database. They actually swap out DLLs which are not being used at that time. They do some crazy, crazy stuff. Um, effectively, we don't want to spend our time doing that. Just throw away what we had and keep only what we need. Um, best practices, best in inverted commas, um, the, the different rules and regulations that people put out on the internet about how you should set max.dop, how you should set tempdb, how you should set database growth, they're all recommendations. Nobody knows your business better than you yourself. Maybe you have max.dop set to one because your application needs that, even if the internet says that's terrible, right? 
the internet is useful, but at the same time it's a problem because anybody with an opinion can have a blog post, whether they're right or not. And they certainly don't know anything about your business. So, um, that's just about time. DBA tools and DBA checks are the two things that I would say can help you immensely in making this standardization happen. And it will avoid you even having to solve a lot of problems because your systems will just be already on a very stable and clean level. With that said, please provide feedback, both for the event and for the session. If you have critical feedback for me, I'm quite happy with that. I'm not sure what the feedback form looks like. I would love it if you could give a little text, a sentence to whatever, if there's anything that you missed, that you wanted to hear, that I could improve or was good. That's also really useful for me. Uh, the same for the event. They need to know how they need to improve, what they need to change, what was good, what was bad. Um, other than that, thank you very much for your time. It's lunchtime. I'm certainly ready. Um, yeah, have a great rest of the day. Thank you.